So I'd like to go ahead and kick it off and get us started. I'm Cassa Hannon. I'm one of the course facilitators for the LEAD program, and it's my pleasure to host as your moderator today. I'm going to begin by introducing our presenter, Bebe Song. Many of you may also know Bebe as a course facilitator. Bebe is the founder and principal of Essanova, a forward thinking interdisciplinary creativity academy applying cognitive science and artful thinking to human development, leadership, and innovation. She has been a Stanford GSB course facilitator and coach since fall 2015 in LEAD and other executive education programs. Bebe is also a certified neuroleadership coach applying brain-based methodology to the development of high-performing leaders. And I know Bebe also has a special guest who will join us toward the end of her session. I will let her introduce um, her guest today. But without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Bebe. Thank you, Bebe. Thank you, Casa. Good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. I'm honored to be introduced by Casa, one of my favorite uh, uh, CF colleagues. As Casa introduced in a proper fashion, my official credentials have always been in business and innovation, but this is how I actually see myself dabbling in multiple disciplines. I see myself as a dancer in my soul, so I hop across the edges of these uh, disciplinary divides. Um, and that informs my point of view. I have, yes, I have today a um, special colleague and a real dancer and choreographer, Momo Seno. He's going to join us and help me lead the session. Momo hails from Romania, but he's, been tra he's traveled um, around the world to experience and uh, dialogue with different cultures, including to the US where he was on the cast of Lion King, among other major productions. Momo, are you there to, to wave, uh, wave hello? Yes, I'm here. All right. <laughs> I'm here, I'm here. Good, good. Both of us are delighted to see you here. Let me give you a quick overview of what we are doing today. Many of you probably still can recall to be more excited to greet 2021 than celebrating many other New Year's because we couldn't wait for 2020 to be over. A few days later, uh, the Capitol riot in the U.S. shocked the nation and many of us here in the U.S., uh, probably elsewhere too, <laughs> were asking, can we have a new start? Can we have a new year again? We Chinese, with the benefit of uh, the lunar tradition, did have a chance for a new year again, this time greeting the year of the oxen, which we hope to, to uh, bring us better luck than the year of the rat. So the Lunar New Year celebration ended two weeks ago, but in two weeks from now will be spring equinox, which for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere would be um, the beginning of spring, the uh, season of renewal. So just like nature with seasons and cycles, human civilizations have cyclical patterns as well, except those patterns, those cycles uh, are rather large in time scale and certainly beyond the person's lifetime. So they're not easy to see. And unlike distinct holidays and celestial days on the calendar, um, a new cultural era often uh, has often has uh, sloppy and, and uh, blurry boundaries with faint signals and a series of starts and tipping points not obvious until in historical hindsight. So with all of that preamble, today I'm going to take you not only across to hop across disciplines, but also on a time travel back to um, a few centuries back into to, to the European Renaissance and also speculate into the future to see if we are on, um, we might be iterating towards a new Renaissance for the 21st century. You're all innovation experts and so you are familiar with the notion of iteration. Well, iteration is not only just for developing new apps, human civilizations iterate as well. So I'm going to point out, I'm going to um, highlight a few re-emerging themes with their new manifestations in the 21st century um, context. I'm also going to uh, point out corrections that need to be made uh, and are being made with the new knowledge over the, the past few centuries for um, uh, innovating towards a new birth. These are the four themes that I will be focusing on today. Convergence of knowledge, 
better understanding of the mind and consciousness, new kind of humanism, and a return to beauty. I consider them the four cornerstones of a 21st century Renaissance. And to bring more uh, relevance to us, I'm going to invite everyone to, to ponder, to contemplate whether this context can inspire a personal Renaissance with, a, with the support from the lead family. And then in the latter part of the session, we're going to interact very differently, um, not just uh, listening and, and, and watching and, and maybe chatting, but also physically moving. Momo will lead uh, us on a uh, movement journey to explore some of those concepts, but having you think and feel with your body. And uh, we'll end our time together today with a special Me Too We song dedicated to the event and we'll dance to it. Yeah, all right. Um, so when people think of Renaissance people, most people immediately associate it with Leonardo da Vinci. And that is the first cornerstone I will lay out. The da Vinci way in the age of space travel, CRISPR and artificial intelligence. May 2nd, a couple years ago, 2019 was the 500 year anniversary of the death of uh, Leonardo, who as we all know was the consummate polymath. Leonardo was neither the first nor the last genius whose interests spanned multiple terrains. These were Shen Kuo and Su Dongpu. For anyone joining from China, you probably know them. They're China's Leonardo da Vinci's from the Song Dynasty, a creative epoch 300 years before the European Renaissance. Westerners are more familiar with these, with these um, uh, people. Sigmund Freud, as passionate about archaeology as, they, as he was um, in psychology. Ernst Mach, both a physicist and a philosopher. Nikola Tesla, correct alternating current problem while walking in the park with his best friend and reciting passage from Goethe's Faust. Modern neuroscience has discovered that um, interest outside of um, one's main pursuit diffuses attention and, and allow problems to marinate. They trigger primary process thinking and remote associations biological basis for uh, uh, breakthrough creativity. Einstein, my discovery was the result of musical perception. It occurred to me by intuition and music was the driving force behind that intuition. After a certain level, high level of technical skill is achieved. Science and art tend to coalesce in aesthetics, plasticity and form. The greatest scientists are artists as well. A recent study actually found that cross-disciplinary arts involvement was seven to 20 times higher in Nobel laureates than among other scientists. Such involvement includes practicing music, drawing, painting, writing, and performing on a regular basis. So, so then why don't we have um, talk about polymaths anymore? Because we had industrial revolutions. Assembly lines and division of labor of the second industrial revolution cut education into boxes and slices of discipline and favored ultra specialization in the workplace. Art and science went separate ways. Education was no longer about uh, developing humans, uh, but about uh, training labor for employment, a condition that continues today. So the Renaissance man died. The fourth industrial revolution, well underway now, is characterized by a fusion of technologies that's bl blurring the lines between the physical, digital, and biological spheres. Cause it's calling for reconvergence of knowledge and uh, coalescence is therefore better suited and re-emerging. It had been re-emerging um, before COVID-19 and the pandemic had certainly heightened the need for multidisciplinary problem solving. And this is just one example. NASA's uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which normally is not active in healthcare, testing their um, uh, ventilator prototype at Econ School of Medicine. The fusion of technologies is probably not new to you um, anymore at this point, but I would like to point out the uh, uh, role that art and humanities play in shaping the future because that role has been neglected or underappreciated in science and technology and probably even more so in the world of business. Fortunately, forward-thinking institutions and leaders are recognizing that uh, the, the value of art in helping us solve complex problems challenging us today and uh, are uh, investing in art-led or art-embedded initiatives in unlocking that power. I will highlight a few examples of art science collaboration in research, 
government initiatives and industry. Many people are probably familiar with the MIT Media Lab, which is a research laboratory not restricted to fixed disciplines, but rather draws on uh, technology, media, art, science, and, uh, and design. MIT Media Lab was born out of um, the first modern movement to, to um, unite art and technology back a half a century ago which I'll talk about um, a little later. And in the following decades, it, it became an exemplar of art science collaboration. Formed in more recent years, this is uh, International Arts and Mind Lab, a multidisciplinary research to practice center for the uh, field of uh, neuroesthetics at uh, Brain Science Institute at Johns Hopkins University Medicine Medi Medical School. Arts at CERN, which is a artist in residency program at the European Center of uh, Nuclear Research. Many people may, it may be easier for people to see art's role in illustrating science or communicating advanced technologies. But as uh, the head of uh, this program points out, art has much deeper value. It provides a framework for discussing the complexities that underlie our contemporary scientific culture. As such, the uh, European Commission launched a STARTS initiative a few years ago as a systematic way and an important pan-governmental step to facilitate interdisciplinary uh, actions. It has been awarding innovative projects at the nexus of art, science, technology, and society since 2016. I mentioned earlier the, um, uh, the movement to um, have dialogue between art and technology first emerged like half a century ago, and um, in the corporate setting, especially in R&D departments or, or labs. This was the most uh, famous example. In 1967, two engineers and two artists, one of them uh, rather famous, Robert Rauschenberg, initiated an experiment in art and technology to facilitate collaboration between artists and engineers at AT&T Bell Labs. The movement went out of favor for various reasons, but um, some of those ex uh, explorations, experimentations actually lead to media art innovation that we take for granted these days. And in the 2000s, the, the movement uh, began to, artists in residence programs began to regain popularity. And now under uh, Nokia, now Bell Labs revived the program a few years ago around the program's 50th anniversary with a new mission to create empathic communication that encourages and enables people's sentiment, emotions, cognition, and experiences. This is seen both as uh, investment in long-range innovation at the company, but also as a leading example in um, art science technology a collaboration in the corporate space. Other examples include a creative residency at Ginkgo Bioworks, the lab at Google Cultural Institute, and for a number of years, a robust residency program at Autodesk. And here is another example, STEAM imaging initiative, STEAM being STEM plus art at Fraunhofer Institute of Digital Medicine which recognizes that being able to move successfully between a variety of disciplines is a crucial competence for future education and innovation. Polymathism in the 21st century is not about mastering several fields of study or being a generalist. It is really about uh, acquiring, acquiring an open attitude, a set of open mind and critical attributes uh, that can enable one to excel across subject matters when opportunities emerge and orchestrate interdisciplinary collaboration with a critical eye and informed outlook. Before I move on to the, to the second cornerstone, I'll take a, a brief pause to see if any of this um, resonated with you. Is, did anything speak to you? How do you feel about it? You can pull out your pen and paper, uh, even your colored utensils to draw or doodle to see anything that spoke to you. And do you have any, what is your muse? Do you have a, a form of art or something else creative that is your marination? Anything that you loved in the childhood that you gave up because it's considered frivolous. A study of the Renaissance will not be complete 
without understanding of humanism. Because humanism was the vital spine and uh, also the defining future, feature of 1400 to 1600 CE Europe. Um, and the very reason that that period is identified as a renaissance or rebirth of ideas. The Renaissance humanism was a movement in thought, literature, and art, typified by a revival in interest in the classical world and studies, which focused not on religion, but on what it is to be human. The backdrop of this was what preceded the Renaissance, which was the Middle Ages and medieval period, when um, feudalism and uh, devout Christian faith ruled society, making it rigid socially, politically, and, uh, and religiously with the rediscovery of ancient Greek and Roman texts, old beliefs were, were thrown out in favor of, of humanism, naturalism, learning, reason, and diplomacy. Some of the key elements of um, Renaissance humanism was a belief in the importance and power of education to create useful citizens, the promotion of private and civic virtue, an emphasis on the individual and their moral autonomy, a belief in the importance of observation, critical analysis, and creativity, a belief that poets, writers, and artists can lead humanity to a better way of living. Also an interesting question, what does it mean to be human? Well, haven't we been asking uh, this question recently as well, but in the context of artificial intelligence, which I'll get to in a, in a bit. At that time, Europe had been exposed to new scientific as well as philosoph philosophical ideas from around the world through both trade, such as the Silk Road, as well as conflict, such as uh, the Crusade. And these Renaissance people took those ideas and developed them of their own into fields that formed the basis of uh, modern science, mathematics, and technology, and often catalyzed by artistic innovation. I'll give one example or tell one story here, which is the invention or, or reinvention of linear perspectives by Filippo Brunelleschi, who was the founder of uh, uh, Renaissance architecture and considered to be the first modern engineer. He was the most famous for designing the Duomo at Florence Cathedral, a feat of engineering that had not been accomplished since antiquity. He also invented the mathematic technique of linear perspectives in art, which was um, later codified by Alberti in On Painting. This uh, uh, radically changed how art was done. Before then, religious art in the medieval times depicted the uh, divine realm symbolically. As you can see on the left, proportions didn't matter. What matters was the significance of the, of the saints. Armed with linear perspectives, uh, artists, Renaissance artists began passionately interested in geometrically accurate representation of physical space and the um, uh, objects within them. And even the religious, religious art since then adopted the approach, combining the heavenly space and earthly space in geometrically linear perspective. As you can see uh, in this uh, disputa, by Raphael. Um, this approach uh, governed the depiction of space until the 19th century when Impressionism rebelled against it, which is a story for another day. This revolutional way of seeing had more implications than just on art. It facilitated scientific discoveries such as measurement of the earth and inventions such as Galileo's telescope, without which our uh, discoveries today, such as a few years ago, the event horizon imagery and our journey into space with uh, uh, Elon's SpaceX uh, rockets and, and uh, the Mars landing uh, most recently would not have been possible. It also fundamentally reoriented Western society from a God-centered view to a materialistic scientific um, view of realism. It also ushered in 500 years of, of mechanistic and materialistic culture, setting it on a spiral trajectory, spiraling trajectory of societal changes, which eventually led to the modern and postmodern worlds. And it, it, it became part of the foundation of the subsequent industrial revolutions, which ironically separated art and science into two siloed cultures and killed the Renaissance man. Of course, the linear perspective was not single-handedly responsible for all of that, either as uh, credit or blame. 
Renaissance humanism was anthropocentric at its core, meaning that humans was man was the center. Humans were regarded in the image of man and um, separate from and superior to nature. So human life was considered to have intrinsic value, whereas uh, other entities such as animals, plants, mineral resources, etc., were resources that could be justifiably exploited for the benefit of, um, of mankind. And its continued evolution in excess resulted in a world that eventually proved unsustainable. We all know what happened to nature, planetary scale degradation and climate change. Another unintended consequence uh, that people may not be conscious of or think about is that now technology is the new God worshiped in the church of dataism. If one, think, if one thinks that technology is the solution, the panacea to make the world a better place, um, we can just um, <laughs> look at what uh, social media has done to our society. Thanks to science, we have vaccines against the coronavirus, but there has also been an invisible virus in the psyche of a large part of the population with, in this country and, and even spreading across the world, who's a cure and inoculation would not be possible without the understanding of the human mind, which will be the subject of the next cornerstone. For the 21st century, we have to redefine humanism, humanism that is holistic and circular. We have to reset our relationships with technology, nature, and spirituality. Technology is a tool rather than the purpose. Nature has intrinsic value and we are one with nature rather than being separate or detached. We have created a world that is super abundant in materials, but it hasn't necessarily brought us happiness or fulfillment. For that, we'll have to look within and to ask, what are we here for? What is a fulfilled life? And those questions call for a renewal of spirituality beyond religion that would um, allow us to reconnect with the cosmos and um, enable us to recapture a personal depth in the way that materialism denies. Once again, I'll give a few moments for folks to reflect and um, think about if anything resonated with you and how you feel about it. One of the major inventions in the Renaissance was anatomy, uh, understanding of the body. As we know, da Vinci was obsessed about the human body. He dissected corpses. He drew them and, um, and uh, made meticulous notes about how the muscles worked, what nerves caused what movement, uh, human proportions, human uh, measurements, etc. Centuries later, the new knowledge and understanding we're gaining today is the understanding about the brain, the mind, and consciousness through interconnected disciplines such as neuroscience and psychology, as well as ancient spirituality. From the time, uh, the days that uh, Spanish neuroscientist Santiago Ramon y Cajal made these beautiful drawings of the um, central nervous system to uh, today the uh, powerful MRI neuroimaging. We've learned a great deal about neurology and how the brain functions. But science is also corroborating with insights and efficacy of ancient spiritual practices that have been around for millennia. For example, the benefit of meditation and more recently the therapeutic properties of psychedelics. One area I'd like to um, highlight in this new understanding about the brain and the, and the mind and the consciousness is their connection to the human body. In the centuries following the Renaissance, our body was relegated to a lower status, to a mere hunk of meat that is perhaps the obstacle of enlightenment. And all of the intelligence is considered to reside in, in the brain above the neck. So for our for us so-called knowledge workers, that is why our education has paid so little attention to our body. There is now a burgeoning movement re-embracing our body as actually being a, a, a vessel for empathy, for feelings, and, and intelligence. So your brain, uh, your body is your brain, and consciousness isn't just in the brain. 
and the body shapes your sense of self. And this is what we'll uh, focus on in our in an experiential way later on with help from from uh, from Momo. Another moment to reflect. Maybe shaking your muscles a little bit. The last cornerstone is the return to beauty. When we think of the Renaissance, we think of the enduring beauty of Mona Lisa, Michelangelo's David, the entire city of Florence and uh, um, other treasures beyond. But the Renaissance also popularized a double entry accounting for transacting art, for example, and also brought us maritime insurance. Bookkeepers were valorized in art and the sublime and the, the practical were intertwined. The Industrial Revolution favored, uh, favored mass production, uniformity, and speed to minimize cost and, and maximize profit. A lot of the cultural values and uniqueness were, were uh, squeezed out of products, even though uh, the Industrial Revolution increased wealth and, and living standards for the average person. That dehydration went beyond manufacturing and pervaded the entire mainstream business culture and culminated in uh, the obsession in efficiency, shareholder value, and, and quarterly earnings, which are, were the 20th century management mantra. Beauty was either considered to be frivolous or hijacked by the so-called uh, beauty industry, which actually makes products that are of poor taste, toxic, and wasteful. Thanks to Steve Jobs, there has been more respect for beauty in the inno innovation world, but the value of aesthetics goes beyond the product design. I call it deep beauty to differentiate from such things as, as, as for example, Botox. It is about a philosophical value. It, it, it's about sensory emotional values and felt meaning of, object, of an object or, or experience. It's critical reflections on how the work is imagined, created, and performed, and how people use and enjoy them. It's what happens in people's minds when they experience such creation and how it affects their moods, beliefs, and attitude toward life. Aesthetics represent our values Values are beautiful because they define our actions through life. If the mind is becoming more of a defining feature of our times, it is only natural that it that provides both more material and more meaning for aesthetics. I'd like to highlight briefly uh, two relatively nascent fields of study related to aesthetics. Neuroaesthetics studies the neural basis uh, for the contemplation and creation of art, understanding and explaining the aesthetic experiences and sensory knowledge using neuroscience. Organizational aesthetics takes an aesthetic um, perspective on organization and on organizational phenomena, challenging the reductionist and exploitative ideas dominating mainstream modern management practice and discourse, recognizing that nowadays people yearn for wholeness and meaning in their everyday lives. So the best way to demonstrate is probably, I'll show a, a quick video here that explains neuroaesthetics in layman accessible terms. The way this project is unusual is that we are actually pursuing a principle. I really believe that form follows feeling and feeling is really what space and architecture are about. Space actually affects people. Design matters. It's why we spend the time making the decisions we do those things that we as designers intuit, neuroscience is now proving have an effect. Google created an exhibition that is showing design's impact on our biology. The way that I explain neuroaesthetics is really simple. It's basically how your brain changes on the arts. When you have a heightened aesthetic experience, like a piece of music, a sunrise, things that really elevate your everyday experiences, they change you. They change your biology, they change your mood, they change your emotion. I called Suchi Reddy and I said, taking the neuroaesthetic principles, could you create three different rooms that would evoke different responses? The goal is to see 
how people resonate with space and to really find out whether what they think they resonate with is what their body is actually resonating with. We respond to the aesthetics of our environments, whether we realize it or not. The band can demonstrate with data from the sensors that, that actually is happening. Heart activity, respiratory activity, skin temperature, skin conductance. We figure out from the data which room is the one that feels the calmest or the most at ease for people. does your physiology feel most peaceful? I think it's what people are searching for. The space between the notes, the place where they can come and just be. The interiors where we work and where we live have a deep impact on our well-being. We always known it and believed in it, but we haven't been able to quantify it and prove it. You enter a space and it's like, I, I like it, but why? This is about data used as a mirror back to yourself. Data is just a bunch of numbers, and we wanted to make it artistic in its expression. It can be really hard to put an aesthetic experience into words. But suddenly, by combining science and technology, we get a new language. We've selected yeah. room two. How's the room now? You're the most calm in. Maybe a watercolor can tell more than a thousand words. Technology has the ability to help you know yourself better. The problems of the future are only going to become more complicated. Solutions have to happen in this collaboration of technology, the arts, and science. Here are two um, examples of companies that make products that enable beautiful experiences. Has anyone heard of Enchroma? It's a, it's a company that makes glasses for certain types of, uh, of uh, color blindness, which afflicts 8% uh, of uh, uh, male population, much less so uh, women. I'll show a quick video that shows the uh, reactions of many of their customers when they first time, when they first see colors. Got these for you. Are they glasses? Yeah. You're kidding. The color blind ones? No. -uh. Yeah. <laughs> They're so expensive. Put them on. You're kidding. Put them on. <laughs> Are you serious? You guys can see this every day. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if you guys understand, but. I didn't know. <laughs> the grass look green? <laughs> yeah. This is unreal. Stop making me cry. <laughs> but it's it's color like I don't nobody understands how. <laughs> yeah. You like? I can see colors. <laughs> you like? This is unreal. I can't wait till you can see like, look how red the barn is. I know, it's so vibrant. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't taken them off since. Now you're not going to want to stop wearing them. <laughs> I wish you could put them on. I and... did, but it doesn't look like much different to me. No, the, <laughs> the barn is deliberately red right now. and like, right? Oh yeah, and before it's gray. Really? Yeah. This side at least. Look at your tie. It's pretty blue. I know. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> this is what you guys see every day? Yeah. Pretty awesome. My skin's actually dark. <laughs> You're not pale. You're kind of tan. <laughs> we won't lift my pant leg up. Do I touch it The sky. <laughs> Pretty blue. I can fly an airplane with these. Yeah, you can. Now you can get your wife in, you know. <laughs> 
the barrels are so much different. <laughs> the the, these glasses didn't change you though. <laughs> you still look just as great. Well, that's good. His hand shaking. Don't worry. Huh? His hand is shaking. Watch it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Good. Australia Francescana is a three Michelin star restaurant founded by Mossimo Butturo, an uh, Italian chef and entrepreneur who has been successfully navigating um, the balance between carrying on the Italian culinary heritage and innovating for tomorrow. Their food is works of art, not only for the palate, but also for other senses. Their space is surrounded by uh, contemporary art. Even, even the staff bathroom doubles as a small gallery as inspiration guide and, and uh, muse for their culinary creations. The fusion of art and food isn't necessarily unique among gourmet high-end restaurants, but what sets uh, Australia Francescana apart is also their culture in and outside their kitchen. Their staff members, including, including the uh, interns, are strongly encouraged to bring their authentic self to, to work, sharing what they love, quite often stimulating new recipes and new ways, uh, new dishes and new ways to, to use ingredients. Mosimo often plays a game of soccer outside on the street with uh, staff members before dinner preparation. That connectedness among themselves and with their, with their community is part of a beautiful culture that can be applicable to sectors outside of hospitality and even consumer products. A new community based in London um, has the ambition to create brave new spaces for everyone wanting more from business and life to make humans more human and business more beautiful. There has been a call, a movement advocating quadruple bottom line, adding a fourth dimension to the progressive triple bottom line of planet, people, and prosperity. Variably called the spirituality, ethics, purpose, culture, or compassion, this fourth dimension measures the impact of, on one's own spiritual growth, the, the why basically, uh, to measure how much loving, understanding, joyful, in, in touch with their destiny one becomes. So lifting business activities to a sacred form. And that really calls for aesthetics in leadership and uh, behavior. As summed up by Elliot Eisner, late professor of art and education at Stanford University, also one of uh, um, America's greatest uh, academic minds. The highest accolade for a business leader is to say he or she is an artist that can solve problems beautifully that the world can't yet imagine. So let's take another moment to reflect and see if you see yourself as an artist, the way that Elliot defines it here. The term artist is meant for individuals who have developed the ideas, the sensibilities, the skills, and the imagination to create work that is well-proportioned, skillfully executed, and imaginative, regardless of the domain in which an individual works. Uh, you may ask, well, why now? We still are in in uh, various stages of lockdown. The vaccines are slow moving. The economy is in recession. War, terrorism, and uh, social upheavals um, pop up here and there. Isn't this too rosy of a picture, a, a new renaissance? Well, the European Renaissance didn't occur under a pristine circumstances, really. It actually was hastened by a much deadlier pandemic, the bubonic plague or Black Death because it loosened the grip of the old um, authorities. It made people uh, question those old certainties and allowed uh, acceptance of new ideas that Europe had been exposed to centuries leading up to the Renaissance. The misnamed Spanish flu 100 years ago helped to catalyze the growth of the roaring 20s. Radical creativity has occurred after deadly pandemics with humans embracing life after the ravage of death. So granted, the new Renaissance uh, may not compare in scale and grandeur, and uh, you, you know, it won't happen next week, next month, or even next year. And you may not hear about it because it's, it's not a news event. Uh, it only can become uh, uh, apparent uh, in historical hindsight. And, and also, there may be more uh, 
ugliness and destructions, pain, deaths uh, coming at us from climate catastrophes or geopolitical conflicts, what have you. However, that is the nature of our creative life cycle. As Taoism teaches us, darkness and, and light coexist. You may also ask, well, what you're saying is so big, what does it mean to each of us? Well, it, it is bigger than, than any of us, but I'm hoping that uh, something in the four forces that uh, I, I discussed touched you in some way and you can relate deeply, that is personally you, and perhaps you can inspire a personal renaissance no matter what with emotional and soulful rooting powering your creative growth. Of course, this is um, very individual. It's specific to each of us to know what that, what that vision would be for you. And um, I would encourage or welcome anyone to reach out for help shaping and developing your new vision. But I'll just um, end my presentation with um, a framework uh, I think all of us here can relate to um, as a way to sum up my pontification today. And that is the three dimensions of awareness, the inner, the other, and the outer. Uh, you, you may have heard of this framework as the three focus of, uh, of effective and well-rounded leaders for the future, the inner focus, other, and, and outer focus. These three kinds of thinking orientation also can power innovation in different ways. The other, which is empathizing with others and, and uh, identifying what others need, is probably what folks are most familiar with through design thinking. Design thinking indeed can, can lead to uh, great innovation, but often it is incremental because that need is in the current reality. In Chroma would not have been invented um, through design thinking because uh, they didn't have a market. Their, their target customers, uh, many of the colorblind people uh, didn't have a pain to be killed. They were fine with the way they were living life. They didn't know what they were missing until you showed it to them. So it's not about pain killing, it's about creating joy. It's the creator leading their customers into a new reality. It is art thinking, and it calls for a strong inner, uh, discovering internal physiological signals, personal aspirations, contemplation of callings, deeper exploration and discovery of the self, asking new questions, pushing highly risky new frontiers, and emotional resilience despite setbacks and distractions, because the art thinker is often ahead of their time, her time. The two founders of Inchroma, it took them nine years to first invent and develop the product and, it's, and, and then to find anyone to buy it because they didn't know they didn't have this market. No one knew the per, you know what value of purple is if you haven't seen it. Uh, lastly, there is um, the um, uh, outer understanding complex systems and institutions, often providing context for inner and other, and facilitating discovery of unexpected connections. And that loosely maps to complexity theory and systems thinking. And I would assert that interdisciplinary and long range time uh, perspective illuminate that outer space and help us see wider and farther. So I have kept you uh, kept <laughs> sitting for a long while. It's now time to loosen up. I will have Momo take us out of the head and into our body. Hello, oh, hello everybody. It's so good, uh, Bebe, what a beautiful presentation and bring us you know, such important information to, to reflect upon it. It is so easy to lose ourselves in, in this day and age with a lot of information that it's outside of us. And I believe that sometimes we only, we only have to turn up the attention on ourselves, on, on our bodies, on what we feel. It's, it's, uh, we are a piece of art that we are moving. We, we love the sensation. We love so much the emotion, I think this is one aspect that makes us human, the emotion and what, what, what caused uh, the explosion within and that has the impact on the outer space, on, on the outside of us. Dance, it's, uh, we do it. We do it since the very first time when, when we start walking, exactly. You know, you see the kids and uh, they hear music, they hear something that pleases their senses and suddenly they're like, they start moving without knowing that they are dancing. Somehow along the, you know, as we grow up, sometimes we forget because somebody tell us, oh, you're not as beautiful. Oh, you cannot dance like Baryshnikov. You cannot be Maya Piseska. You cannot be somebody else. 
but in reality, all you can be is yourself. And I think this is the greatest gift. And because of that, the body, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a ticket to freedom, you know, as in the moment when we, we let our mind and not just to compare ourselves to anybody around us, but to somehow to see where we can go, how we can be, I think it's amazing. And because of that, I know we don't have too much time, but I really, we invite you to move a little bit and to dance and, you know, let's, let's bring the attention somewhere, somewhere within, you know, with all this always, you know, meetings, Zoom and internet and all that, we forget about this, this marble thing that, you know, it, it, it helps us, it helps us to move, it helps us to dream, it touches us, we touch and we, we discover so much knowledge just through the body, I mean, beauty and uh, and, and knowledge, it is ingrained within ourselves. All we have to do is like reach deeper and just like sometimes just listen to, to ourselves and to be like, all right, let's see what we can do. So, you know, further, not, not so much talking, I can lose. Baby, please hear the music and let's, let's move a little bit. And uh, yeah, yeah so, okay. yes, of course, everybody, please stand up if you want. You know, hope everybody can see me. You know, happy to see you. They're happy to share their time with you. You know, and I think, as baby, this is what being human the ability to share the beauty that is within and make a change outside of us. You know through beauty, through art, through everything that moves our hearts. It's, it's that simple. Sometimes all we have to do is take a, a journey within and see the wonders of the world. Oh, Mo, that was so <laughs> beautiful. Well, anyway, um, that was beautiful. I love the combo of the two of you. <laughs> well, um, so I... We do have the, the song, I know we're out of time, but for just whoever can stay, I'll, it's about five minutes. Um, it's a song that was created for us, for me to we. Um, so if you guys need to go, feel free to do so, but I'll just, uh, for, for those who can, I'll, I'll share the song with us. We've just moved, so you can just sit back and relax. But uh, later on in the session, just for a little while, with your newfound dance skills, uh, I'll get you up <laughs> to dance to, to it with a few moves on my prompt. You'll follow me, okay? We'll see what, uh, what we can do, oh, yeah? Okay, so it's a song that was created uh, um, by actually a fellow Stanford alum and also a songwriter. Oh,
Thank you so much, Bebe. Everyone, thank you so much for your time and attention today. We are so excited for more to come. Thank so you, Casa. And, and thank you for the committee. You guys have all worked hard. Thank you for this opportunity to share some time with you. And thank you all for coming. I wish you all a fantastic meet week ahead of, uh, ahead of you and lots of learning, lots of bounding, lots of connecting, and uh, all the best with your work and life ahead in the future. Thank you, and so, such great appreciation for Momo. Thank you so much for bringing Thank you, guys. Thank you for inviting me, and keep on dancing. <laughs> <laughs>